Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Big Blend Radio Success Express show. Uh, we are excited to welcome back Rita Sever. She is an organizational trainer and an author, and uh, her books include Supervision Matters, 100 Bite-Sized Ideas to transfer, uh, transfer, Transform You and Your Team, and Leading for Justice, Supervision, HR, and Culture. That's her latest book. We first met her with Supervision Matters, and um, now she is one of our regular Big Blend contributors and radio guests, and you can go to her website, supervisionmatters.com, and today we're going to delve into what a successful organizational trainer is like what it's all about and she's successful so we're going to find out more about Rita since she's going to be on our shows even more so uh Rita welcome back how are you great thank you so much Lisa it's great to be back and good to see you again you too so let's get the scandal <laughs> <laughs> well this is, one thing I wanted to ask is what is an organizational trainer versus a leadership expert um, so they're very closely connected. Often one will do both things. I can, mm -hmm. I used to do coaching, consulting, and training. And now mm -hmm. I really focus on training because I think part of why I decided to go into training, which is a little different than what you asked, but I think related, is that it is a way to raise up leaders within the team. So it really mm -hmm. is is on the group dynamics as well as the individual strengths. Okay, yeah, so with both of them and then everybody working together. And then you use the word supervision a lot. Do you wanna talk about that? Uh, give everybody some insight about why that word is such a important thing for you. Right, right. I do think it's a critical role in an organization. And unfortunately it does have some baggage with it because supervision has been misused in some mm -hmm. instances, you know, going back to the overseer on the plantation and that connotation. But what I see, I have a background in human resources. And what I saw in my work was that the individual supervisor made such a difference. Mm -hmm. People would be happy in their jobs or frustrated, and they would be productive or phoning it in, you know, and everything in between. But so much of it came back to how they worked with their individual supervisor. Mm. So when I started my business after working internally in organizations, I decided that's where I really wanted to focus mm -hmm. because people were doing leadership work, people were doing management work, but I wanted to focus on that little tiny niche of how do you best supervise people to make it a win-win for the organization mm -hmm. and the individual. So that's why I focus on that. Well, it lets people know that someone is there. Right, you know, exactly. Yet not, not your best buddy either, because I think that's kind of the same thing as parenting in a way, right? You, you, I mean, Nancy and I are good friends, you know that, but she's still <laughs> the mom and still gives me the eye. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and if she doesn't give me the eye, then I'm like, oh, you don't care. You know what I mean? So <laughs> right, it, there it's are parallels like that. for sure. Yeah, you have to have a strong relationship, but it can be neither, you know, in your face micromanaging, and the other extreme just hands off, do whatever you want. Just like in parenting, neither of those extremes works for supervision either. Okay, there. Yeah, it it's about caring at the end of the day. It's about caring and connecting and being clear about what what needs to happen. Mm. How and do most we of, get where we want to go? What's interesting with you is you work mostly with nonprofit organizations. And what was the choice for that? Is that, you know, it's, well, I think it's important. I personally think it's very important because we look to nonprofits at, as being part of the solutions and for what's going on in the world, whether it's something to do with diversity or if it's something to do with wildlife or the environment. Nonprofits right. could be are even about running businesses and helping small business owners. There's a nonprofit for just about everything, you know, right. but they're the, the they're the helpers, you know. Right. Yes. Yeah. So um, 
I'll say two things about that. One is that I think everything that I do applies to both businesses and nonprofits, whether they're for profit or not, Mm -hmm. because it's about people and people Mm -hmm. are people. The bottom line is different, but the process to get to success is very similar. I personally chose to work with nonprofits. I've thought about this and I, I wanted to make a difference in the world. And part of it was I grew up the youngest of six children. And I think I grew up feeling like there was never enough and I wasn't seen. I felt like, Mm. here I am, here I am. And when I came time to look for a job, I realized I wanted to help people who in a bigger way than an individual family felt like they weren't getting their fair shake. They weren't being seen. They weren't Mm. being respected. And the nonprofit sector is where I felt like I could make that best happen mm. and best support that kind of work oh very cool I think it's cool and yeah. and at the same time um I know we talked about this last time with leading for justice we were talking about you know it's when a nonprofit puts themselves out there they have to live by their morals of what their values are as an actual nonprofit so if you right. are um, a nonprofit that's for the environment and the environment or environmental protection, um, are you, you know, using single use plastic in the lunchroom? <laughs> exactly. I once um, did a training with an environmental group and they actually chastised me because I put plastic covers on my training materials. And they said, you know, that's a waste. Why are you doing that? And it was like, yeah, you're right. I. I will change. Um, so you're right that they, more than anybody else, they need to walk their talk. Mm. Um, and their mistakes are much bigger than other other companies that do the same thing. It's just sort of standard protocol. Nobody yeah. really calls them out. But nonprofits, people look very closely in terms of are you living your values? Mm -hmm. And yeah, you could be running the nonprofit for years and all of a sudden find yourself like, oh, I did all this, but nope, just because you kind of, you can, that, that's something I wanted to touch on. You could be in this for a long time, you know, anyone in, in their role, whether it's a business or a nonprofit and slowly kind of let things slide because you've been doing it for so long. And then, you know, go to make changes and you touch on this in your 10 the 10 questions that we asked Rita um and everyone her uh answers are all up on blend radio and tv.com and also link is in the show notes um but you talk about having for people to take their um you know if they have to make improvements or change to be self-aware you talk about that and sometimes I think people don't want to be self-aware because they don't want to see if they're making a mistake and then it's like oh, I want to cover it up in an organization so no one sees, but that means you probably don't have the right leaders. Like That's bottom line, that's not going to work. Eventually it's going to come out either immediately or years down the road and it's going to be messier than it would have been. And the truth is it's counterintuitive, but when leaders admit that they made a mistake or Mm -hmm. messed something up, it actually builds trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard to do, but it, it goes a long way when somebody sees their leader being able to admit admit a mistake or say, I could have done that better there that helps build the connection and the trust. So it is Mm -hmm. an important process. And yes, I think self-awareness is a really underrated leadership skill because it, supports the values, living with your values, both as an organization and an individual. And it impacts how people show up. Like, do they understand how people react when they say a certain phrase or their tone Mm. is opposite of what they're saying? You know, yes, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. People know that's not true. And so then it erodes the trust. So I think the self-awareness is critical. Mm. And and then doing something about it. Absolutely. When you need to either mm-hmm. keep doing what's working and what feels, you know, is right mm. or clean up what needs to be cleaned up. 
When it goes to training, I know you you can do it virtually, right? As well as go in person. So you work with people anywhere around the world, right? right? right. Um, how important is it for people to stay on top of things? Because you talked about um, like sexual harassment, you know, those laws change too. There, there's legalities. And then there's like, hey, the world is being more conscious yeah, as an organized, a nonprofit. Nonprofits pretty much have to be conscious of pretty much everything that's going on right now. We have right. to use pronouns. Like I have a friend who's in a nonprofit and she's like, I'm going to pronoun class. I'm like, what? No, I'm going to pronoun class. And, and you know, because right. we were trying to learn about this too. And she's like, you know, explain things to us too. Because we're like, okay, well, we had this happen. Like, what does this mean? You know, mm -hmm. and I think not just nonprofits, but businesses need to. So is that part of it as a trainer is going in and keeping people aware versus just keep doing your 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 goal and not seeing those those things you need to be aware of? Absolutely. It's about bringing, you know, as you said, the up to date, both laws and um, understanding in the culture of where mm -hmm. things are playing out. So talking about that. And it's even more making all that relevant to their work. So mm -hmm. why does it matter that you use someone's preferred pronouns? How will that both impact your relationships and how will it impact your business, mm -hmm. whether your business is nonprofit or not? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so making it relevant, that's a critical part of being a trainer. Mm -hmm. And so I... I did a lot of harassment trainings and I would change my focus because the basic content is the same, but one year I'd build it on what does respect look like? Because mm. harass, building a, preventing harassment really comes down to building a respectful workplace. So what does that look like? What does it feel like in particular? And then the next year I'd focus on what does it mean to have a culture of consent? Mm. All, you know, not just around harassment, but around everything. And mm. then how do gender norms impact the workplace? So mixing it up and making it relevant and related to the last topic, the self-awareness, it's critical that the leader, the executive be in the training. That's probably the bottom line thing that makes it real to people. Mm. If the leader doesn't show up and show that they are learning also, then people know it. they're just going through the motions. Oh, see, that's exactly it. And you talk about, we asked, oh, um, if you won the lotto, what are you going to do? You know, get you won right. the Powerball. Um, she's going on a cruise. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, you know, but you talked about, making sure nonprofits had an HR person and enough staff or volunteers. So and not that's just an important HR, but the the kind of HR that I do, which is user friendly and supportive and isn't about liability. It's about how do you help people do their best work? Mm. So, so the HR role, um, I know because we do an employment law show every month uh, with uh, Ward Heinrichs and he always goes, no, they come to me when HR ain't working. <laughs> yeah. Because right. I'll go, though, no, that's a, and I said, well, what about this? What about that? Like sexual harassment. And he goes, well, about the work, you know, the handbooks and everything. He can guide people. He says, but really, that's HR needs to stay on top of that part. And he's like, the HR is crucial in, in a workplace. So it seems that you feel the same thing that the right HR is crucial in a workplace. I do. And I, again, think that HR has a big image problem. I, okay. I watched a, a show recently where um, they, it was 911. I was watching 911 and they had a whole series about why would you call HR? That's like the Gestapo. And that's an image problem. Is that R Reno 911? No, this was just uh, okay. 911 it's set in LA. Oh, oh, okay, I thought you were talking about this, the, co the cop comedy. Right. I was well, like, it, it's about <laughs> both the fire and all that. Okay. But anyway, I think HR, ideally, HR needs to be there to support employees. It is mm -hmm. seen as being basically the police or the, the snitch. 
<laughs> yeah, the the control of protect in service of management. Mm -hmm. And I want to flip that, that I think HR is really about serving the employees. And in doing so, you will protect the organization. Yeah. But the focus needs to be on how can we make this work for our staff? How can we protect our staff, which is what harassment laws are about? How can mm -hmm. we make it safe for you? And how can we get people who aren't doing their work out of here, whether they're supervisors, managers, or whatever, mm. and not get rid of them, but either help them be successful or say this isn't the right place mm -hmm. for you. Right. Kind of go, yeah, if you're not, because the, the business needs to function. And at the end of the day, there's the bottom line. Right. And if you're funding someone to sit and twiddle thumbs or look busy, you know, we all know about those people who make themselves look busy right? You know, and play right. games on their phone when they're supposed to be making that call that the business right. really needs, you know. And it starts um, with, you know, engaging with them. Why are you doing that? Are you bored? What's going on? How can we make this work better for you? <clears throat> and then if that doesn't work, then, you know, this isn't where you need to be. Yeah, it could just be a bad match. And that going going towards this, though, the HR to me is really like the communicator of the glue of a company for, you know, the owner or the, the main leader, like the HR person is not the snitch, but the helper of, and sometimes maybe the main, the head person, like an owner of a company may not be a people friendly person, exactly. but it doesn't mean they don't have a good idea. And, and, you know, that it's not, if they could be an inventor, they could be you know, outstanding. And I'm not going to name names because I'm getting close to it, <laughs> but may not be good in the people area. Exactly. And sometimes they don't, you know, you need to just keep them in their office on the other side. Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes some personalities may not change. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I've had a job where somebody has told me that I hired you to do the people stuff. You know, I, I can be I ended up being the liaison, <clears throat> which again okay. is the role of HR, getting okay. the ideas, as you said, from the top out to staff and vice versa. Mm. You know, this isn't landing well. How can we redo this? Because staff mm -hmm. hates this new rule you implemented. We got to change it. So there's rules too, like the, I know California, which is where you're based. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's, you guys need your own library of rules <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because it's always changing and some very good stuff for, for the employees, I think. So we talk about it and some things there's like, oh, well, that didn't work or it did work. Like the fast, um, fast act for fast food workers that came out was, you know, because it really was based on helping fast food workers who were there longer have some support like for healthcare and things like that. And fast food work is the model has changed of who they're employing. So I think right now it's crucial with what you have and that people can get your books and also you can work with them, you know, virtually or in person because we're also in a generational shift. We're in a culture shift right now. We're an environmental shift right now. And there's things like, you know, people getting mad about fast food workers getting healthcare or getting paid they're like, well, that, you know, that's it for work for teenagers and some people shouldn't be in there. And I'm going, I've been through many communities, you know, Nancy and I drive this country pretty well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the only job someone's going to be able to get. Right. And if that is their survival in some small towns, you're not going to go get somebody else. That's right. it. And if they're reliable, you better treat them like gold because right. you don't want to have to be there from four to four. Yeah, right. every day exactly. so um there's this balance and when these laws change there's an argument to be that that happens there's people that rile up against it and the people that are for it but then they have to go back to work it reminds me of the band Fleetwood Mac they have their drama then they have to get up on stage together <laughs> even though they've had a huge fight so right. you know so exactly. how I mean does that happen like in in organizations and workplaces where maybe the employees got a benefit they really needed and the employer or the executive director, or the head person is like, well, this really sucks for our bottom line and the employees feel it. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That happens in so many different ways. That's one example of how it happens. You know, a rule might have come through that made sense, but the way it's playing out, those unintended consequences are often devastating. Mm -hmm. um, and even like you said, sometimes it's a good new rule, a good new law, and yet there's an implementation, implementation period and it shifts things. And so, yes, there is a process of working it through, talking it out, seeing what we can change, what we can't change. And then bottom line, okay, this is where we landed. Now we have to refocus on what we're doing here. Absolutely. How, how do you, what about organizations with politics happening the way it is right now, especially for nonprofits, because you can't say issue driven uh, nonprofits are not politically connected in some way to politics. Right. And it, we're in such a weird society now where it is completely like, you know, red or blue. And then if you're independent in the middle, like, you know, so a nonprofit may like, well, we've interviewed a number of very large ones and even doing the first interview there, you know, it's like, okay, we don't, we do not attack this side or that side over an issue. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. though they're very much like, you know, I mean, you, when you, even with what we do, we have to talk to them beforehand, make sure they know that this isn't a setup or an ambush where I'm going to go in. Well, don't you think this person did that? Or you sided with this person? Mm -hmm. It, it, and so that's how, how I know those nonprofits are actually working for the greater good of what, you know, um, they're doing. Right. And I think there's, that underlines the distinction between values and politics. You know, nonprofits, as we started to talk about, need to be driven and supported by their values. But those values don't necessarily have to transform into politics. And keeping that distinction that we want alignment in support of our values, but that doesn't mean we're going to tell you how to vote or how to think or we're going to hash things out politically. Um, we need to focus on the work we're doing and be respectful again, have a respectful work environment, which means that we trust, you know, you get to have your opinion, I get to have mine, and we're going to work together even if we disagree. Right. Because I think that's an important thing of what's happening now. I mean, I see families that aren't talking to each other. And it's like, you know, if you can't be connected in families, how do you do it as in your workplace, you know? Right. So, so having those conversations are important. And this leads me to one part of the 10 questions we were talking about pet peeves. And it seems like you are not for the cookie cutter formula of training. There'll right. be no cookies with Rita, but it is National <laughs> Chocolate Chip Cookie Day today. So you can bring yes, cookies to I training, like though. Cookies. Yes, I but... like my cookies, too. <laughs> yes, in terms of training, I'm very leery when somebody says <clears throat> something like, um, you know, we'll teach you, <clears throat> excuse me, everything you need to know about leadership in eight hours. And the training is completely didactic and there's no room for reflection or questions or what about this example? That makes me very skeptical. It doesn't mean they can't give good tips, but I think it's gonna be short-lived because mm -hmm. unless somebody as an adult learner, unless they can take it in and say, how does this apply to me? How am I doing this or not doing this it's going to just move on when they leave the training hmm. that's what makes me skeptical of the cookie cutter trainings i have set trainings but i am very clear at the start of the training that your questions and your conversation are vital to make this your own mm -hmm. i you know we've done seminar communities together because you can't have a a region be a destination if the community doesn't want people and all so I mean we've been in in places where they're like literally fighting and we came in as the peacekeepers 
Mm-hmm. And all I'd said at the end of it, can I have a Bloody Mary during this? Because <laughs> there's anger. And right. we had what we were going to talk about. And eventually we just were like, why don't you just all give us your questions? Uh-huh. And we were able to problem solve. And we found that because everybody said, you know, when you first started learning about going in as a seminar or any kind of, you know, program, hold all questions to the end. Otherwise, you'll never get the important information out. And we found and and maybe because we were doing some, you know, um, you know, well, yeah, a little chaos management, but it was really um, issues after places have gone through wildfires and how to do their their press and things like that you can't be screaming and yelling at each other and saying please come to our there was a place that had a huge wildfire but you couldn't see it as a traveler if you unless you really knew the woods really well and people were like no we'll tell people to come see our moonscape and wildflowers in the spring I'm like that's really not the thing you say you know you you know there's a transparency but then there's you know let's let's be positive you know right right um anyway so that's where I was getting to being able to field the questions, suddenly people in the room started problem solving and having a dialogue that weren't having that dialogue before. Right. Yes. And I feel like if people can't ask questions as you go along, sometimes I get stuck. Like, I I don't understand what you're saying here. So how can I build on that? So I agree. I'd much rather have questions as they come up. And it does, I have to be careful not to get derailed, but if something's in your way or you don't agree with what I'm saying, I want to hear about it so we can talk it through and then you can come along with me for the rest of the training. Mm, And I bet you half of the part of the room wants to discuss it too. But I think, I think a training should be teamwork. You know, I really believe it's, it's part of that dialogue of getting, um, a workforce together to to problem solve and learn and grow. And when they're all in a training, like you said, have the leader in the same room, you're right. going to start to see how people's brains are thinking, where mm-hmm. ideas are coming. They're you know they're in, you know they're sparking inspirations. You know, they're and experiencing what you're trying to teach them. <laughs> how is it now? You know, because people are still doing remote work. Are you seeing people come out where? you know, you do go out in person or, you know, is remote working to do trainings? Um, It works surprisingly well, um, especially, you know, with a a good, like Zoom works really well because you can do breakout rooms and still be interactive that way. You know, you can't have a huge crowd for it to be interactive, but with a good sized crowd, you can. So I'm still doing some Zoom and I'm still doing in person. Mm -hmm. There is something about in person that can't be replicated. It's true. It absolutely is different when you're in person and very powerful. But as you said, because of the virtual training, I can work anywhere. And that's a real gift of it. Well, it's interesting when you say that you can, you do smaller amounts of people. I think that's more intimate in a way. And do you find that... um, you know, you're talking about the, I can teach you everything in eight hours kind of trainer, right. uh, which you're not pro. Is there follow-up that needs to happen? Like people go to an event and then it's uh, like, I see all these people do, Hey, we're doing this event, but we're going to create a Facebook group. So everybody can communicate and do those kinds of events. And maybe they'll do a fo- one more follow-up or something. Are you finding that, is that an important thing too? Absolutely. When that can happen, it does make it so much stronger. Mm -hmm. Often my best model is to do a training with the whole team. And then what I suggest is what I call supervision circles. So smaller groups get together like once a month for three months after the training and basically dig into a topic like, okay, let's talk about the nitty gritties of feedback. We covered it in the training, but What comes up when you think about giving feedback? Mm. What bad experiences have you had? What good experiences have you had? What gets in your way? And so it's more hands-on digging in. And doing that for a few months helps both deepen their understanding of the material and, as you're saying, helps them work well together. 
So mm-hmm. they start learning how to be pure coaches to each other. And then oh, the third nice. leg of this is individual coaching for people who need help with, you know, I've got a really tricky situation. I need some support. That's cool. And do do you do exercises? Like, do people have to write? Because I always find personally that if I don't write something down, it's it's right. It went to lunch and left. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> So I encourage people to do that. And I often will stop and say, okay, let's take three minutes. What did you learn? How does this apply to you? To again, right in the moment, give them time to think about, here's what I want to do different, or here's what I'm doing well. See, that's what I think it's so, we've gone through so many changes and now we're in the world of ding, ding, notification on the phone, on the watch, on the computer, on, I mean, it's like we're ding, ding, dinging ourselves out the window, you know, right. it's a little crazy. So I wonder about focus and how hard that is in a training. And like you're saying, I think you've got all those things where you, you manage because you're interactive, keeping people focused. And right. part of, you know, an alert and actually taking that knowledge and in, in and, and getting it. But I think once they walk out, like, you know, the ding, ding, ding start to happen. So in your trainings, are you working with that kind of thing of how to stay focused in your job in a way with what, like, actually, when you talked about self-awareness, do that individually so that you don't get lost in the, in the shuffle of, of, and then what leads to chaos management. Exactly. I think the taking time for self-reflection is a critical part of that and really hard. I acknowledge it's hard. As you're saying, mm-hmm. you have every minute of your week scheduled and then there's the dings on top of it. But I underline that if someone can take even five minutes at the end of a week to sit quietly, shut off all your machines and think about how did this week go? Did I show up the way I wanted to show up? Was I the leader I wanted to be? Is there anything I need to clean up or do differently or that I want to do better next time? Wow. You can fit a lot in five minutes Mm. and then go from there. And I apply that in a similar way to supervision that I underline, you need to meet one-on-one with the people you supervise on a regular basis. And so that, again, means you schedule it and you prioritize it. And part of that time is to connect. And part of it is to catch problems before they get in the way. Mm-hmm. And, and to make yeah. sure you're on the same page. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I remember years ago, this actually before the magazine, I was in sales and we you know, remember Benjamin Franklin daytimers, and I'm sure they're there now, still there. And we went to seminar about them because, and I became a huge fan of them because they talked about even in in the daytimer, they had a whole page for your day's reflections at the end of the day, Uh write down what happened, write down what you want to change or what was great, you know, everything you're saying, and then look for what's happening the next day. And I, you know, and I wonder about that too, as you know, in leadership and everything, okay, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. So you're, you're kind of closing the day and starting the day. And whenever I didn't do the next day, I was always paranoid. What's happening the next day? What's happening the next, I have, you know, and I wonder about people having sleep issues. If it comes Mm -hmm. from not not doing these writing down exercises, right? you know? Yeah because it is both capturing all those things that are buzzing around your brain. And it's also setting the intention of, I want to be intentional. How Mm -hmm. do I want to show up? What are my priorities? So Mm. absolutely think it helps Mm. help you sleep better. (laughs) Now for some fun, you're having a dinner party. You're going to invite three people. I want to talk about those three people, but are you, are you cooking or are you getting it catered? Uh, probably catered. I might do one, like I'll probably make cookies or something like that. Oh, okay. Well, the meal. Cookies. Okay. The, I want to know what is, what is your favorite cookie to make then? This is, this My is important. My cookie is the classic, um, chocolate chip with walnuts. <laughs> I love them. Uh, On oh, the crispy side. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, I like the crispy and then with a little chew in there, you know, right. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So, 
let's let's talk about these three people who's coming to dinner so the eat your cook people. can we just have a cookie dinner who right. cares about <laughs> anything let's just like, have a cookie bar i right. like that right. <laughs> so the three people that popped in my brain were susan scott susan kane and michelle obama so Susan Scott wrote books, Fierce um, Conversations, Fierce Leadership, and she has a new one, I think, Fierce Loving. And she really taught me so much about, through her books, about having hard conversations, addressing issues, speaking your truth. Mm. And um, she really influenced my work. And she gave me a great blurb for my first book, which was a wonderful gift. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And, right. and being fierce, I know you talked about being an introvert, which I don't see, but, but <laughs> being introverted, well, I'm like that. I'm either I'm in or out. <laughs> like right. Like at the end of yeah. the day, I, I want my alone time, you know, and quiet right. time, but, exactly. but it doesn't mean you're weak. And I think a lot right. of times people don't realize that um, introverts are strong. Absolutely. And that's the second person who I would invite is Susan Cain, who wrote the book Quiet, which is about um, being an introvert in the mm. world and at work. And she really taught me so much through her book about, yeah, just the strengths of being an introvert. And I realized that all my life, the things that I thought were flaws that I was thoughtful and quiet and sort of wishy-washy. When I ended up in HR, I realized those were my superpowers, that I was thoughtful and I could see both sides of a situation and I could help them come to a resolution. And she just gave me a new lens for seeing the strengths of introverts mm. in the workplace in particular, but in life also. Mm. That's cool. That's, I, but it's really true. You know, it's um, the thoughtful part. And that's kind of where I was thinking also about when you see someone just sitting at their desk and thought, you know, like, oh, are you daydreaming? Like when you're at school and daydreams are good because dreaming <laughs> and imagination are good. I'm sorry. I don't see anything wrong with it, right. but you know, you know, their heads in the clouds. Well, then you build castles, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I think that's what I, I was getting to that. We've lost that that part of just taking time to think it's like when you're saying you know make that schedule to meet with your team members you know I feel like you have to do that with yourself individuals and as leaders and business owners and nonprofit leaders take that time out to reflect for yourself and then maybe reflect on the business or the organization too absolutely yeah. yeah, I really, I worry about, you know, I have grandchildren and they have limited screen time, but I think about the young people who just are on their devices all the time and never have time to sit and just think about things mm -hmm. or yeah. as you're saying, imagine what's possible. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. true for all of us, not just young people. Yeah, it, it's true. Cause you, you yeah. It's like when the, it's like a TV is constantly going and then I know people can't sleep without a TV, um, you know, yeah. that's, that's, great. Yeah. that's why I like to go into the woods. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, and then hiking. I want to just mention my third person. Oh, Michelle. yeah, Michelle. I don't yes. have to say much about her. Everybody knows her. And, um, you know, I think a dinner with those three women would be incredibly insightful and exciting and We'd have some great conversations about life and leadership. She knows about being fierce. In yeah. fact, she uses that word quite a yeah. bit too. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. maybe she'll bring fresh vegetables. She got everybody to eat healthy <laughs> and she'll say, look now, are those walnuts organic? Where did right. your chocolate come from? <laughs> right. Well, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you again, Rita. Um, everybody, you can see Rita up on blendradioandtv.com in our expert department and find her two interviews about her books. And you're going to hear a lot more of her on our shows. But go to her website, supervisionmatters.com. 
And again, her two books is Supervision Matters, and the second one is Leading for Justice. And of course, keep up with us here at BigBlendRadio.com. Thank you so much, Rita. We're so glad we're going to have fun. We're going to do <laughs> panel discussions. I think we're going to have to put you on with the attorney, Ward Heinrichs. I think we're going to have to have you know, those kind of conversations. Yeah. That'll be fun. I know he was very excited that you were joining our team here, so it's going to be fun. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Great to be with you. Take care. Let's go get cookies. <laughs> yes. <laughs>